Well, hey, we are in week number four of our Hero Series, and this series is all about looking at the life lessons of the men and women of the Bible and learning from them. And we have a theme verse that we're using throughout this series. I've said it the last couple weeks. I would love if we all would just read it together. So you ready for this? Ready? Read it along with me. Here we go. Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. What this verse is saying, it starts off by talking about a great cloud of witnesses. Those are the men and women of scripture who really lived and they've run their race. They've gone before us and now they are in heaven and they are cheering us on because it's our turn to run our race right now. And you might think, well, how could they cheer, be cheering us on right now? It's because their lives are mentioned in scripture. And when we open the Bible, we read about their lives. They are cheering us on by how they lived their life. See, the things they did that were good, we want to model. We want to copy those. The things that they did that weren't that great, we want to learn by those by not doing that. So they're cheering us on and they're teaching us as we learn about their lives. So the hero that we want to talk about today is Abraham. And I think it's a perfect hero to talk about on Father's Day because he's known as the father of the faith. And as I was thinking about the that uh, point this week that he's the father of the faith, I was reminded of this kid song that, you know, maybe you've heard it before, but it's called Father Abraham. Now, how many of you have heard Father Abraham song, right? It's, if you've never heard it, it's kind of like the Christian hokey pokey, all right? Because what you do is you're going, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. And then you go, right arm. So then you're singing like this, and then you sing it again, and you're going like this, and then you're putting your feet in. So you're kind of singing it like this, kind of like the hokey pokey, right? Well, you know, and then I was thinking, oh, man, I totally blew it last week. I blew it because last week, if you remember, we talked about the hero Moses. We talked about Moses, and I'm like, oh, there was a song about him too, right? Remember? Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Oh, let my people go. Bump, bump, ba, yeah, 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 Pharaoh, Pharaoh. And so, man, I, we blew it. We blew it? No, not really. Those, bo- those are both cheesy songs for adults, but I know the kids like them. But, but anyways, hey, we are talking about Abraham. And so Abraham is cheering us on today to run our race. And as we look at his life, we can learn a lot from his life. And I believe that it's kind of like if we were in a stadium running, running our lap, running our race, and he was up in the stands cheering us on, if he would come down out of the stands and run just one lap with us, I believe this is what he would say. Abraham would say, trust God when you do not understand. Trust God when you don't understand. See, right from the get-go, When you start seeing Abraham in Scripture, the Bible introduces him right off the bat with someone that has to start trusting God. In fact, in Genesis chapter 12, it says this, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household, watch this, to the land I will show you. I mean, God just tells Abram, he says, Hey, go, I I will show you. I'm not going to show you yet. You just start going, and I will show you. Then he makes a promise. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and to your offspring, I will give this land. See, Abraham was defined. He was known as a man of faith. That, this is the Old Testament. In fact, the New Testament speaks of Abraham being a man of faith in Hebrews, where it says this, By faith, Abraham, when called to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And so he has credentials to be able to say to us, trust God when you do not understand. 
Can you imagine how many times perhaps Abraham asked the question, God, can you just show me a little more before I go? Can you give me a little more of the details? Can you just show me stuff before I obey? And many times God is just calling us to trust him before that happens. In fact, the definition of faith in the Bible says this. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for. And look at this, certain of what we don't see. That's what faith is. And I love this definition of faith that I found recently. And it says this. I think this hits it out of the park. Faith is being okay with knowing later. That is a great definition of faith. Because faith is saying, you know what? I'm going to trust God. I'm going to step out. I'm going to obey. I'm going to do what he's calling me to do. And I'm okay with not knowing all the details up front. I'm okay with having a partial view. I'm okay with trusting God. And I'll know more later. Because God is faithful to show us exactly when we need to know. In fact, this, this became very clear to me this week as I was traveling. I was traveling on an airplane this week. And when I went to my destination... It was really great weather, and even at 30,000 feet, you could just look straight down and see everything. But when I was coming back, um, you know, it was overcast. In fact, when I, it's kind of funny. When I was getting on the plane, coming home, I put this on my Facebook. Some of you may have seen it, but I was getting on the plane, and the, and the airline staff, was, they were kind of introducing all of themselves on the PA system, and they were going through, you know, they, they said, you know, the pilot's name is this, and then the co-pilot's name is Justin Case. Get it? Justin Case. And I'm thinking that name does not fit for the pilot, but it certainly fits for the co-pilot because, well, just in case something happens to the pilot, you have just in case to save the day. I'm like, wow, that was kind of kind of strange. But anyways... So I was glad Justin Case had it all covered. But, but anyways, coming home, it was really overcast and stormy. In fact, they had to reroute us. And, but we're on our descent. I mean, we're coming right to land in Cleveland, and we could not see anything. I mean, we're getting ready to land. It was like overcast, cloudy, gray, couldn't see anything. And I'm thinking, how does the pilot do this? They are my heroes. I mean, how do they do it? And, and, you know, I don't know all, but I, I know enough to know, well, probably they're, they're just looking at their instrument panel. And probably they're having headphones on and they can hear the air traffic controller tell them where to go. And I just had this revelation, like, that's exactly what we have to do when we don't see everything. We have to look and we have to listen we have to look at the instrument panel that God has given us right here. The instrument panel of God's word that we can look in scripture and when we don't understand, we can still trust God and know later. And you know what? We have to be listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit because he's always talking to us. We just need to listen. And so as we get into this today, you know, we can ask the question, why should I trust God when I don't understand? Because that's scary. It's hard. Why should I do that? I'll tell you why. Because God always does the right thing. God always does the right thing. That's why I can trust him, even when I don't know everything up front. So I want to give you six ways that God always does the right thing because I believe every single one of them relate to us today. And here's the first one in your notes. God always does the right thing even when you face a detour. Even when your plans change, when they, they don't go exactly how you thought they were. Let's look at Abraham's life because he can teach us something about this. Remember the scripture we just shared earlier where God told Abram to go? So here's what the Bible says. It says, then Abram set out. That's good. That, that Abram, he, he was responding to God. He was responding to God saying, go. But watch this, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. That was the detour. He didn't know about the famine when he started to go. Plans changed. 
there was a detour. So you know what Abram did? He, he was looking and listening to the voice of the Lord. It says, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was so severe. Man, we face detours all the time. We face times when, you know, we're planning this, we're going this direction, and all of a sudden something happens and our plans change. And you know what? For most of us, I know it is for me, I get frustrated. Man, I don't like detours. In real life, when you're driving the car and you see that orange sign, you're like, oh, right? It's going to take more time. I'm going to be late. I wasn't expecting the detour. Nobody likes detours. But you know what God does? God uses detours. In fact, God used this detour in Abraham's life to do something incredible in his life. Because notice it says this, he was in Egypt for a while. And you know what happened while he was there? Look at this, in the next chapter it tells us, it says, so Abram went up from Egypt, because now the famine's over, so he's coming up from Egypt now with his wife and everything he had, and Lot, his nephew, was with him. Watch this. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. Where, where did that happen? It happened after the detour. It happened as plans changed. And do you know that sometimes God is the one behind that detour in your life? God is the one allowing those plans to change because there's actually something better as you walk through that detour. In fact, I hear stories sometimes where, in fact, this really happened where this, this gentleman, he, he fell down and he injured his hip. So he had to go to the doctor and he didn't, you know, it was, it was you know, just kind of cramping his style. Like he just threw a wrench in his plans, you know, and he's like, oh, you know, I have to go through this. So he goes to the doctor and the doctor's checking out his hip and they found a tumor that they, had ne- they wouldn't have known unless he would have, you know, he fell and he had to go get checked for his hip. So they found this other thing. And the doctor says, it's kind of good that you fell and we, you had to check your hip because now we found this that we can take care of. And sometimes God is behind those detours and sometimes we just have to trust God because even when we're in a detour, God always does the right thing. Amen? Let's look at the second one. God always does the right thing even when you prefer others. Even when you put someone else first, when you let somebody go in front of you, when you let someone else have first choice and you get second, do you know that God will always do the right thing and take care of you? I mean, this whole concept of preferring others, I mean, that's living the life of love. That's what we're called to do. But do you know why sometimes it's so hard to prefer others? Because we're kind of afraid, well, man, if I let that person go first, they're going to take the best thing. What am I going to get? I mean, if I, if I prefer them, what about me? And that's valid. We, we think that way. It crosses our mind sometimes. We want to prefer others, but we are thinking about ourselves. And did you know that when you prefer others, when you give, when you just trust God, that he will always do the right thing and take care of you? You don't have to worry about that. In fact, look at this situation that Abram, Abraham went through. It says in chapter 13, it says, Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together. And their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders and mine, for we're close relatives. Is not the whole land before you Let's part company. Now watch what Abraham said to Lot. Watch how he preferred others. He said, hey, if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Look at Lot's response. Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of Jordan towards Zohar was well watered. Or can I just say, it looked better. It looked better. So he chose what looked better. In verse 11, so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. What what happened to Abraham? Well, it says Abram lived in the land of Canaan. He took what was left. He preferred others. 
And when we prefer others, God always does the right thing because as you move along in this story, this is what it says. The, the land that Lot took that looked better at first ended, not, ended up not becoming that great. See, eventually it became the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. And many of us know about that. We're going to talk about that later. But the land turned out to be not that great. And the land that Abram ended up having ended up being very good. And so we see in Scripture that God always does the right thing when we selflessly prefer others and God takes care of us. Let's look at the third one. God always does the right thing even if it takes a long time. Even if it takes a long time. I think many of us can relate to this one. Well, see, now we pick it up in Abraham's life where we're about 10 years now since God gave him that promise that he was going to have children and he would become a great nation and he would be blessed. And the Bible says this in Genesis 15. It says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. Why did God have to say that? Because God spoke something 10 years ago and it hadn't happened yet. How many times do, do we face situations like that? Man, I know God has promised this to me. I know God has spoken this to me. I know God's going to come through. I know God's going to provide. I know God's going to do this. And we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. And what happens when we wait? We can become discouraged. And that's what was happening in Abraham's life. That's why God had to show up and encourage him. In verse 2 it says, But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, God took Abram outside. Now it says, Look up at the sky and count the stars. Watch this. If indeed you can count them. Is it even possible to count the stars? No. We can't do that. What God was saying is this. Just as you can't even count the stars, you're not ever going to be able to count your descendants. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. So Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. And we need to learn that God always does the right thing, even if it seems it takes a long time. And you know what? We can also learn from Abram's life because sometimes when things start taking too long, what do we have a tendency to do? We have a tendency to start m trying to make it happen, right? And actually, Abram got off track because, you know, he tried to have children through someone else other than his wife. In fact, he did have a, a son, but it wasn't the son of promise. It was Ishmael. And he learned a lesson from that, that we can't try to make things happen. We have to trust God and wait for his time. And see, God's ways are higher than our ways. His understanding is greater than our understanding. Can I just say something that may, it's not going to make you feel good right away? Listen to this. God normally takes longer than what we want. God normally takes a little longer than what we think, what we want, what we're expecting. God is slow to us, right? To us. We think, but God is slow. God, God, God uses the crock pot, not the microwave. God's a slow. He's patient. And you know, when we say that, really we're saying it from our perspective because to God, he's not slow. God's perfectly on time, isn't he? In fact, Scripture teaches us that in the New Testament. It says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, watch this, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Watch this, as some understand slowness. So what it's saying is this, God's not slow, we just think he's slow. We just think he's slow. Instead, he's just patient. 
There's a difference between slow and patient, isn't there? God's patient. He is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, God's timing is perfect, and he'll go as slow or as fast as he needs to go to reach a soul for eternity. And he's about people and touching people. In fact, this reminds me of this guy that was having a conversation with God, and he was saying, God, man, what is $1,000 like? And God says, oh, like a penny. He goes, wow. And then the the guy said, God, what's a thousand years like to you? And God said, oh, like a second. He goes, wow. He goes, hey, God, do you think I could have one of those pennies? And God says, sure, wait a second. <laughs> so God's timing is not our timing. But he always does the right thing. And when we grow in our faith and when we grow in trusting God, we can start to be more okay with that. We start to become more okay with that in his timing. Let's look at the fourth one. God always does the right thing even if it seems ridiculous. Even if it seems absurd. Even if it seems like that's crazy. Well, let's fast forward again through Abraham's life. See, now we're about 13 years past the last scripture that was 10 years. So we're about 20-some years now past that original verse where God said, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. You're going to have kids. You're going to be blessed. Well, okay, 20-some years now, and it hasn't happened. And Abraham's just saying, man, I don't know if this is ever going to happen in One day it says in Genesis, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, Your name will now be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. Watch what Abraham does. It says, Abraham fell face down and he laughed. He was like, this is ridiculous. Just laughing. Like, yeah, right. That's crazy. And he said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And in fact, as this conversation was going on and, you know, it goes on to, To say, then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now watch this. I think this is hilarious. Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. She was eavesdropping on this conversation. Okay? So Abraham's laughing at this, having having a child at age 100. Well, watch with Sarah. Sarah's eavesdropping, and it says this. It says, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. She laughed. So now she's cracking up, saying this is ridiculous to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. I mean, I think think if you really look at that scripture, God was a little kind of offended that they were laughing at that. It's kind of like, "What, what are you laughing for? Are you kind of thinking, I can't do this? Hey, anything is possible with God. All things are possible with God. Sometimes when we think that is ridiculous, that is absurd, we have to know that God always does the right thing. Sometimes we don't think it's, you know, normal. But our normal and his normal, you know, sometimes aren't aren't the same. But Abraham was a man of faith. And he was okay 
with moving forward even though he didn't know everything up front. Let's look at the fifth one. God always does the right thing even if it doesn't seem right. Now let me explain this one to you. This is a little different than the other one. Even if it doesn't seem right. Let me explain it in this story about Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis it says, Then Abraham approached him, God, and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Let's stop right there. Notice in the other scriptures, God was approaching Abraham. This scripture, Abraham's approaching God. Why? Because Sodom and Gomorrah, where Abraham's nephew Lot lived, got so bad. It got so evil. And because we know that there's consequences to sin, God said, I have no choice that I'm going to have to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. When Abraham heard this and knew that his nephew was living there and his nephew's family was living there and he thought probably other righteous people were living there, Abraham confronted God. And he said, God, this doesn't seem right. I, I, I'm not feeling real good about this. It just something doesn't seem right about this. It seems like you're not being fair. It seems like this doesn't add up. It seems like it's going against, you know, my convictions. And, and then Abraham and, and God had this conversation. And Abraham's kind of upset by this. And he goes, are you going to destroy the whole city of Sodom and Gomorrah if there's righteous people in it? What if there's 50 righteous people, God? God says, I won't if there's 50. And so Abraham starts getting in negotiation mode. He goes, what about 45? 40, 30, 20, goes all the way down to 10. And God said, if, if, you, if there's 10 righteous people in that city, I will not destroy it. Well, you know what? There was not even 10. There was not even 10. Only Lot and his family were the only righteous people. So Lot and his family left Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham came to a place knowing that God was going to have to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah that he makes this statement that we know that he was a man that trusted God, that he says this in verse 25, look at this. But even though it doesn't seem right, will not the judge of all the earth do right? See, it doesn't seem right to me, but God, I'm okay knowing that you're going to do the right thing. And you know what, church, we need, to, we need to get to that place because all you have to do is kind of look around what's going in the world a little bit, watch the news a little bit, and you can start thinking, that just doesn't seem right. That just doesn't seem right. <laughs> and we have to get to a place with trusting God enough that we say, even though it doesn't seem right to me, why is God allowing that? Why does God do that? Why, wh and we're trying to ask all these questions and trying to figure it out. We have to get to a place like Abraham said and just say, it doesn't seem right, but will not the judge of all the earth do right? And I will trust him for that. I will trust him. Let's look at the last one. God always does the right thing even if we don't understand. Even if we don't understand. We come to probably the, the most known, greatest story of Abraham. Of now that Isaac... The son of promise is born. The son he was waiting for all these years. He's born and he's, he's in his teens now. And God approaches Abraham one day and asks him to do something that just, Abraham just didn't understand. And he, God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, this son that he was waiting for all these years. In Genesis it says this, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. And you know, the story goes on to say that Abraham just said, okay, God. And he got the wood, and he got the fire, and he had the knife, and he brought his son. They just started walking up the mountain. And, you know, Isaac started to look around. He goes, let's see, I see the wood, I see, I see the knife, I see the fire. Dad, hey, Dad, where's the lamb? You forgot the lamb. And Abraham just says this simple response. He goes, God will provide. 
as we go. I don't understand, but God's going to. So they get to the mountain at the top, and he lays his son down, ties him up. Can you imagine what Isaac's thinking? And Abraham lifts the knife up, ready to do what God asked him to do, to sacrifice his son. And all of a sudden, an angel stops him. And there was a ram over off to the side. And God said this to him. He goes, now I know that you fear me. Now I know that you trust me. And his son was saved, and they sacrificed the ram instead. And we mention that story because there's times when we do not understand what's going on in our lives, what God is asking us to do, where God's calling us to go. And we have to get to a place that we can grow in our trust, that we can grow in our faith and know God's character and know his heart that God always does the right thing. In fact, the whole key, if I, I said like, how do we grow in trust? Because can I say that I'm not quite, I'm not qu- quite where I want to be. But how can I grow in my trust? How can I have more faith? And can I say instead of trying to stress over trying to make, you know, be more faithful, can can I just say here's how you grow in trust. It's knowing God more. Just know him. Because the more you know him, the more you'll know his character and his track record that he never fails us. You say, man, the more I know God, the more I can trust him. Because he's good and he never fails. The Bible actually says that in Psalms. It says, those who know the Lord trust him. So we need to be trying to know God more, know his heart, know who he is. When we do that, the trust will follow. Let me give you three ways that we can grow in trust in closing. Do you want to grow in trust? Abraham taught us how to do it. The first one is this. If you want to grow in trust... Believe that God could do anything. Believe that God could do anything. You know, there's a quote that helps me get to this place of really trusting the Lord, really trying to know him, and it's this. If I have to know everything before I step out and obey, what I'm actually doing is I'm reducing God down to the size of my brain. Because that's what we do a lot. We're like, God, just give me more information. I want to know more. I have to understand more. Then I'll obey. God's saying, obey. And you'll know. And you know what? How big is God? He's big. But did you know that we can shrink him down to the size of our thinking when we're trying to, we have to know everything before we trust him? So believe God could do anything. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He had embraced the promises, was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from from death. You know what this is saying? Abraham got to a place in that story with Isaac That he just says, I don't understand why God's asking me to do this, but I do know this. I do know that if he allows me to go through with this, I know that God must be going to raise him from the dead. That's what that means. He reasoned. He figured, well, God's just going to do something I'm not planning on. Now, I'm not here yet. I'm not here in my faith. But I have a lot of room to grow. And I want to believe that God could do anything. Amen. The second one is this. Don't make earth your home. Don't make earth your home. Many times we get so comfortable with here in the now. We get so comfortable with our possessions. We get so comfortable with our bank accounts. God's asking us to give. We can't give because we're getting so comfortable with our bank accounts. God's asking us to go and we're too comfortable. And, and we're too comfortable with here sometimes. Don't make earth your home. You know as, as Abraham went where God was calling him to, to go, it says this. It says, by faith he made his home, but he lived in tents. That means he knew that that final destination that God was taking him was not his final home anyway. For he was looking forward to the city whose architect and builder is God. 
So even though God brought him to a great place, he still knew that it wasn't his final destination. And we need to think that way. It's okay to have things. It's okay to enjoy life. We should be. My goodness, we need to be enjoying life. Amen? But you know what? Just know that this is not our final destination. We're passing through. And don't get hung up somewhere because we're too comfortable with here and we can't step out to what God has called us to do. Number three, live with an eternal perspective. Live with eternity in mind. The Bible says, and so from this one man, Abraham, and he was good as dead, meaning he was old, <laughs> came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And all these people were still living by faith when they died. But they were longing for a better country. Well, look at this, a heavenly one. Have an eternal perspective. Have an eternal perspective. Have eternity in mind. When God's calling you maybe to go talk to that person or to give something to somebody, think eternity. Maybe think about their eternity. Think have an eternal perspective that life goes beyond the grave. You know what? Our bodies will expire someday. But we live on forever. And we have to think that way. And have that trust and faith in God that life goes on. And live life that way. Amen, church?